Hello, everyone. I'm Harvey Brownstone. And if you're a fan of our show, you'll know that one of our most popular features is our Gone But Not Forgotten series, featuring interviews with family members of some of the greatest Hollywood stars of all time. Today, we're welcoming the only child of a beloved actress, singer, and comedian whose spectacular career on stage, screen, radio, television, and nightclubs spanned nine decades, the fabulous Rose Marie. Starting at the age of three, she began performing as baby Rose Marie in vaudeville, and at the age of five, she had a seven-year contract with NBC, which led to a hugely successful radio and movie career. But she's perhaps best remembered for her iconic role on TV as the bombastic Sally Rogers on The Dick Van Dyke Show. She also played Doris Day's sidekick, Myrna Gibbons, on The Doris Day Show. And for 14 years, she was the top center square on the popular TV game show, The Hollywood Squares. How can we ever forget that famous quote, Rose Marie to block? <laughs> and she appeared in hundreds of TV shows, often numerous times, in shows like The Monkees, The Hollywood Palace, The Dean Martin Show, SWAT, and Murphy Brown. She was also the subject of the highly acclaimed 2017 documentary, Wait for Your Laugh. And now to commemorate Rosemary's 100th anniversary, a brand new CD is being released by Sepia Records entitled Rosemary Sings, The Complete Mercury Recordings and More. This very special compilation CD features Rosemary's 29 classic recordings of show tunes, standards, and novelty songs from 1938 to 1966, including previously unreleased tracks with liner notes written by our guest, including photos from the family archives. Rosemary's legions of fans have been waiting a long time for this CD. I'm delighted to welcome Rosemary's daughter, Georgiana Guy Rodriguez, to our show. Georgiana, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Very glad to be here. Thank you. Georgiana, I must tell you that I'm so happy this CD is coming out because most people think of your mother only as an actress and they have no idea that she was a very accomplished singer. Isn't that right? Oh, absolutely. She played nightclubs after she kind of grew up after being baby Rose Marie. She went into night nightclubs and was a fabulous singer and was booked all over the country, played places like the Copa and those types of clubs. And then, of course, she opened Vegas, which is uh, another thing that she did that a lot of people don't realize with Bugsy Siegel building the Flamingo Hotel. And she was there. They, he had called her. He had seen her nightclub act. And she and Jimmy Durante and Xavier Cougat opened up the Flamingo for Bugsy Siegel. She so was she was actually the doing... first headliner. Absolutely. And, well, first of all, she never stopped. She never took a break. She never stopped. She never quit in 90 plus years. She loved it. She absolutely loved it. And... George Gershwin said that your mom was one of the five best female singers in America. Your mom must have been blown away by that. Oh, <laughs> Not all, I, I'm sure that she was, but we found that clipping recently. And when I heard it, I, I was blown away because one of her favorite composers was Gershwin. And I said, oh, my God, that's George Gershwin that's saying that. I mean, that's, that's an amazing thing for a composer of his stature to say. So... We were quite thrilled with that. I said, that has to go on the CD. I mean, that clipping is in there. And it's, it's, it's amazing. When your mom was a child, did she ever take any singing lessons? Oh, goodness, no. <laughs> no, her, her mother pushed her on the stage when she was three. And she sang. And she quoted her book, her uh, book is called Hold the Roses. And the reason for that title is when she was three years old, she went out and sang and she blew everybody away and they went and they gave her a bouquet of roses. 
And she walked off stage and she turned to somebody as a three-year-old and said, please hold my roses. I have to take my bow. And out she came and took the bow and never stopped after that. What a natural talent. This new CD shows off your mom's phenomenal musicianship, her jazz sensibilities and her versatility in being able to sing just about anything. Do you think your mom was disappointed that once she became a famous TV comedian, her music career kind of took a bit of a backseat? I don't think so. She she transitioned with the times. If you if you look at her documentary, it's a history of show business. It takes you from being a child star to her going into vaudeville after that. And then as she was growing up, then becoming a nightclub singer. She loved to sing. When you listen to these, there are so many tracks here that I had never heard of. And we found them. She saved everything. She say, I mean, it took it took two years to go through that house. And when I heard some of the tracks, I couldn't believe it. I didn't realize that she went back to her to her Italian heritage and did some of these these songs in the version of, you know, come out of my house kind of thing. And and uh, I, I I just cracked up when I heard them. I, it was I said, oh, my, I, I had no idea what she had recorded until I heard 29 of these tracks. I mean, it was it was un, it was unbelievable. It blew me out of the water. I had no idea. Georgiana, she, then I've got to ask you, why sure. did it take so long for an album of your mother's music to be made available to all of us? Well, I think because we were involved with the film that that was two and a half years in the making. That was not easy. And because we had so much material, we had 65 scrapbooks. We had cans of 16 millimeter films, which she had saved because when she would do like Johnny Carson, for instance, she would say to one of the crew guys, uh, can I have a copy of that? And they go, yeah, sure. And they'd go in and they would run it off. So we had cans of 16 millimeter film. The research that delving into her career took years because I would open up a drawer and we'd find something else. And to try to even condense it into that documentary, the Comedy Museum in Jamestown, New York has her scrapbooks digitized, 65 of them. She saved everything, every clipping, every card, every menu in a restaurant that she went. I mean, it was unbelievable. She had she had photographs in there that were just were just amazing. And when we were working on the film, she would make a reference. Her memory was fantastic at 90, 91 years old. She could re she could tell you the color of the walls in the Copa. She could tell you where the cash register was with the bullet hole. She mentioned that one day. Oh yeah, there was a bullet hole in the in the side of the cash register. And we all went, what? You know. Her her memory was was unbelievable. Unbelievable. She could name any club she ever played. She could name what it looked like, where, how, when. The guy that did the film came from Cleveland. And he, he very into, you know, Cleveland and he was raised in Cleveland, whatever. And when he met her for the first time, all I had to say to her was, uh, well, he's from Cleveland. Oh, I played the such and such club there. I did this. I did that. And he looked at me and his mouth dropped. He's 33 years old. And I took a chance. I had been approached by two other people and I met him at Jerry's Deli in Los Angeles and he walked in, he's 33 years old. And I went, oh my God, he could be my son. Oh God. So, but his wife had my mother's book and she had a bunch of tabs in it. And she used to make reference when we were shooting. She said, your mother would say something like, oh, such and such. And I played such and such. And I went here and they would go to the scrapbook. And there it was the review, this, that. I mean, that's how keen her memory was until the day that she died. Do you think she saved everything from her career 
hoping that maybe one day you would make a documentary like you did? It's possible. You know, we found these recordings on cassettes. We found them on 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 reel to reel. You would open up a closet and go, oh, Lord. Okay, this is another month of research. And so we kind of put the recordings behind us because we were concentrating on getting the film out. We thought the first thing came the book and then the film. And the film took so much of our time. And we were dealing with her health problems at the time. So we were you know, there were days that we wouldn't do it. There were days that we would. And 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 it just took a very long time. But we had to get everything in, including, you know, vaude- vaudeville, Vegas, squares. As you know, Peter Marshall narrated it. And, and Peter's still a very close part of our of our family. And it it just took that amount of time to go through it. So we kind of put the recordings on the side because the film was the number one thing that we wanted to get out. And like I said, that took two years. And then now when her 100th birthday is coming up, August the 15th, we said, well, we've got all these recordings. Now is the time. And she's a marvelous singer. And every time on the Dick Van Dyke show, when she would sing, the fans would go crazy. She has 35,000 more fans now than she did when she was alive. Imagine. That's true. It's absolutely true. She has 35,000, probably even more than that now. But her fans would go crazy saying, please, can we get more singing of her? We love her singing. Can we get more singing? Well, I So now it kind of evolved to the point of, okay, now we have to utilize these boxes of recordings that we have. And so so that's when we started. If you're a coffee lover like me, it's always fun to discover a great new blend. I recently found a terrific new company, Breakfast at Dominique's, that's created a series of coffee blends to honor the legacies of the greatest Hollywood legends. And I'm thrilled to tell you that now, Breakfast at Dominique's has introduced the Harvey Brownstone Talk Show Blend, It's my very own exclusive, delicious, bold, rich, balanced, medium roast coffee, and I just know you're going to love it. It's made from high quality organic beans produced using fair trade practices. If you'd like a great cup of coffee, give Breakfast at Dominique's a try and order the Harvey Brownstone Talk Show Blend at hollywoodblends.com. They'll ship it right to your door anywhere in the world. Sipping our coffee is the perfect way to watch our show. I understand you're having an online release party for the CD on August the 15th. How can people tune into that? Well, it's going to be on YouTube and it's on her YouTube page called Hold the Roses, all all one word. Or you can go to MissRosemarie.com and all the links are there as to how to get the CD, the virtual thing on uh, YouTube and we're going to play some of the songs and everything and we've got clips and things that some of the fans haven't seen she's she has a I have learned a lot about fans and I didn't realize the loyalty that some of these fans have because I was a kid I was growing up you know I knew she was famous but the fan base is unbelievable. She has, she hasn't, and I don't even think she knew her fan base was that loyal. I think if she knew all this now, I think, first of all, she'd love it. And second of all, she would be so surprised because uh, there is a whole group of people, mostly baby boomers, I would assume, you know, most of them are, are, are up there like me too. I mean, I'm a baby boomer. Me too. And I think that they that they enjoy and now because of all of the stations that are showing all the old sit sitcoms and Caroline in the City and SWAT, which she did, and and the monkeys, she did three or four monkeys, and their fan base is is unbelievable. 
So they look at her as the monkey mother. And the last time that they, I was told the last time that they went on tour, uh, it was jammed at this stadium. And there's a song associated with her in the monkeys. And when they started to play it, they put her picture up on the video and they said the crowd went nuts. They absolutely went crazy. So anytime anything with the monkeys, they have a fan base. So that has grown. And it's, it's amazing. And it's, it's thrilling because we, you know, I want to keep her name out there because of the, of who she is and what she's done. And so many people don't realize that she basically covered every aspect of show business. Every oh, aspect. absolutely did. Now, when your mom was a young child, she had a very mature voice. She didn't sound anything like Shirley Temple, for example. She sounded no. more like Sophie Tucker. Exactly. Which was phenomenal. And some people thought she was actually an adult who was a dwarf, correct? Correct. When she got her radio show on NBC, which you mentioned, they said, no, that's not a kid singing. That's a 45-year-old dwarf that's singing. And so they had to go out on the road to prove that she was singing. But unfortunately, in certain cities, there was the child labor law. So her father, who was pushing her and, and, and basically she was supporting her family, as she basically started supporting her family as a child and never stopped <laughs> But he would get arrested because of the child labor law. So he would go to jail and then they would bail him out. And then, and, and then she would come out. And in those days in vaudeville, you didn't do just one show. You did like eight in one day or 10 in one day. So she would go back and she would do her 10 shows. And then the next day, her father would get arrested again. And it, would, and it just kind of continued. But she was extremely popular. She she was she she was famous. She was actually bigger than Shirley Shirley Temple at that time because Shirley Temple wasn't around yet. So she toured the country as Baby Rose Marie, and then she as she finally started, finally proved to everybody that she really was a child. Yes, and at, and at one point she took pride in the fact that she said, "I was the first one to lip lip sync." Because in one of the clubs, because of the child labor laws again, so they had a recording of her. So they played the recording and she went on stage and she lip synced it. And she said, I was the first one to lip sync. And a lot of people, I don't even think she put that in her book, but I heard her say that one day and I got a big kick out of it. I said, oh, my God, I had no idea. You know, Georgiana, one thing that's very unusual about your mom is that unlike many other former child stars, your mom had absolutely nothing negative to say about those years. She never said that she was traumatized by working too much or that she missed out on having a normal childhood. And in fact, she often described her childhood as really wonderful, even though it's clear that this woman, this child was working almost constantly. Isn't that yes. amazing? It truly is because... She really wasn't close with her father. She that that relationship was was kind of tough because and it became worse as she grew older because she started to grow up. But she she never said a bad word about it. She loved she from the time she walked out and said hold hold my roses, she she loved it. And Never had a bad word to say about the business or anything. Never. She truly loved it. And and just just a real quick story. I had gone on the road with him when she was doing Four Girls Four with Margaret Whiting, Helen O'Connell, my mother, and Rosemary Clooney. And I had gone on the road with them. And I watched her backstage. And... I watched her work. She was doing more of her nightclub act. She was still singing a little bit there, but she was doing more comedic things at that time. And I, but I watched her take her bow 
And that's when it really hit me because I looked at her looking out at that audience and I said, by God, she really loves this. She it was a one of the things that I say in the film, it it was like a drug. She had to perform. She had to. She never wanted to stop. If she wasn't working at one point, she was going nuts. She would call up her agent and said, I'm not working this week. Come on. And just and just never stopped. And well, then let it, me it, ask you this. Given that your mother had that makeup, I've had a lot of children of celebrities appear on our show, and they've all said that being the child of a star is nowhere near as glamorous as it sounds. Do you agree with that? You know, it's funny. I was I was very close friends with Dick Van Dyke's daughter, Stacy, And just people don't... Re- the problem with being a child of a celebrity is that you're not quite sure who your friends are. Are they there because they like you? Or are they there because of who your parent is? And I remember talking to Dick's daughter about that because she she was very young at the time and she was excited about having somebody sleep over at the house. That was going to be a big deal for her. And the next time I saw her, I said, how did the how did the sleepover go? And she went, oh, not so good. And I said, why? So all she wanted to do was to hang out with my dad. Oh, and that's part of the problem, because you get people that look at you in a different light. They don't look at you as, hey, this is my friend and we're going to go to the movies and we're going to have fun and this. So you become very guarded. And I think that's part of the problem. When I was a segment producer on The Tomorrow Show with Tom Snyder, the first thing that I booked, somebody said, well, what are you going to do? And I said, you know, I have no idea. They wanted me to produce a segment. And I said, and they said, well, what's the thing that you know the most about? And I looked at him and I said, being the child of a celebrity. Uh, They said, well, then go ahead and book that. And I did. I got Frank Sinatra Jr. I got Dick Van Dyke's daughter. I got Maureen Reagan. And I got David Carradine. And we talked, you know, they talked about the difference of growing up in that atmosphere. And yeah, I'm very lucky. I have very good friends and I trust them. I have friends that are 30, 40 years. My mother's manager, I'm friends with his daughter who I've known since I've been 16 years old. So we both understood the business because her father was a manager, which helped a lot, but it, you become very guarded. You know, I had one thing in school, high school, one day I was walking and I was lucky because I didn't have the last name of Van Dyke. So, which was very identifiable. So I was basically Georgiana guy in school. But I had one kid one day practically push me down and and I turn around and he goes, who's your mother? And I went, what? And he goes, who's your mother? And I said, Mrs. Guy, who is yours? (laughs) I love it. And that's, and that, and so then he turned back to his friend and goes, see, you, you know, you don't know what you're talking about. Because I never, in in school, you didn't want to have it out. And Dick Van Dyke Show was popular at that time. And so you would have, yeah, you would have kind of things like that. That personally happened to me and that personally happened to Dick's, Dick's daughter. So not to say that it's a terrible thing because some of the perks overweigh all of that, but Well, let me ask you about one of the perks. Let me ask you about some of those perks. When you were growing up, you got to meet a lot of big stars like Frank Sinatra, Gordon McRae, Phil Silvers, Rosemary Clooney, and of course, all the stars from Dick Van Dyke. Did you get starstruck around these people? The only person that I really got starstruck with was Frank Sinatra, (laughs) which is true. Again, a, a, a very quick story. We were at the house and, and my mother was friends with Lucy, Lucille Ball. 
And Lucy had called her and said, Desi and I are shooting the long, long trailer and we're on location. We're going to go right by your house. Can we stop by? And she said, sure. So she said to me, Lucille Ball and Desi Arnaz are going to be stopping by. And I went, okay, so, I mean, you know, and then, so they came over and they're in the living room and having a ball. They did a scene from the long, long trailer in our living room because Lucy was saying how great Desi was in this scene. And my mother and father are there and they're laughing and it's great. And to me, it was okay. Somebody else is coming into the house. Really? And when they left, my mother said to me, well, what do you think of that? Lucille Ball and Desi Arnaz were just here. And I went, yeah. And she got so mad at me because I didn't flip out. And but you knew who she was, right? Of course. I, yeah. I mean, everybody knew. Uh, Lucy actually, <laughs> Lucy one day actually took me with her mother was uh, with her, Lucy's mother. Dee Dee. Dee Dee, exactly. And we went. Uh, and my mother was doing something and Lucy says, well, I'm going to take, I, I assume it was Lucy Jr. as a baby, but she said, we're going to go to Marine Land. So I went to Marine Land with Lucille Ball and her mother. And there's a picture of me with Lucy uh, at Marine Land. Mother said, well, I got some, I got some business I got to do. Do you, do you mind taking Noopy and, and taking her to, you know, the thing? And said, no, no, bring her along. So Lucille Ball actually took me to Marine Land with Dee Dee. And it was like, okay. I was just, okay. Well, I and, have to say that was definitely a perk of being the child. Well, that, yeah. And at the time I was a kid and, and I thought, okay, I, you know, I didn't watch Lucy all that much. I really didn't. I was going to school and she was nice and, and, and I knew she was famous, but okay. And so I never really got starstruck except with Frank Sinatra. <laughs> and who were some of the other close friends your mom had in show business? Was she friends with the people from the Dick Van Dyke show? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. She was our family. I became close with Dick because his daughter wanted to ride horses and I have horses. So I remember Dick coming to me going, she wants a horse. What do I do? And I told him and so she and I used to go to horse shows together. So I was very close with his daughter. And of course, naturally, I would bring her home and, and I'd see Dick and Marge at the time. And they were very, very nice. In the early years when my mother was doing nightclubs, I would have to say most of the people that were at the house were musicians because my father was a very good musician. He was one of the top musicians in this town. So when they first moved out here to California, he was working. She was just starting to work nightclubs here. But because of my father and his connections, and there, I don't think there was a performer that he didn't play for. And um, so all of, all of the people that were at the house were mostly musicians. They had great parties. And they... It was a time that was really something, but only when she started to get into television did, did it start to change a little bit. Uh, Lauren Green came, Lauren Green and his wife used to come over and they would play bridge. They go, oh, it's, oh, it's Lauren, it's Lauren Green. I, oh, well, you know, we're going to play cards. Okay. You know, I go in my room, I do my homework and I go to bed. I can't even imagine it. I, I know you've been asked this question a million times, so I'm going to apologize in advance, Georgiana. Sure. But did your mom have a favorite episode of the Dick Van Dyke show? I think she loved Sally as a girl, where they where Dick has to prove that, that she's female and Laura has says and he tries to help her. And then uh, Maury thinks Maury and Mel think that she's having a crush on dick i think that 
definitely one of the ones that she loved because it was one of the best takes in the world was when Dick meets an old flame of Laura's and he's a priest. And he invites Sally over, not knowing he's a priest. And he invites Sally over and Sally's ready to ready to go. And she comes through that house like a cannonball and then does one of these, you know, okay, where is he? And then she sees him in the, and he, the guy has the collar on and she goes, priest, you wanted me to meet? And the audience went nuts. So it's, you know, it's hard for her. It was always hard for her to, to pick out one. She loved the shows where she could perform. She bugged Carl all the time. Cause at that time, really the only sitcoms that, people were performing were uh, Lucy. Right. And, and so she would say to Carl, look, you've got me, you've got Maury, use us, use us. All she wanted to work, use us. And well, uh, yeah. Your mom was a very talented comedian. Was she funny in her personal life when she was not on stage? No, she was my mother. That was separate. It was family at home. It was it was never cracking jokes or anything like that because that was home and that was family. And especially when my father was alive, it was family. So anything that had to do with the business she would discuss with my father. And that basically was it. When she started, it was my father that got her into comedy on stage because some of these places like Slapsy Maxie's and some of these clubs that she was playing, they wanted her to stay on longer. And he said to her, he said, you're going to have to do something else. You just can't sing for an hour and a half. And so she started to kind of delve into comedy. And of course, who did she go to? But her friend that she knew from way back when was Maury. And Maury is or was the human joke machine. He really was. And so he basically started to help her write and act. So she started to do comedy. And then when the nightclub phase started to phase out, she said, well, I guess I got to start to do this television stuff. And that uh, she just evolved from one to the next, to the next, to the next. And her first job that she did in television was a gun smoke with James Arness, directed by John Rich, who later became the director of the Dick Van Dyke show. That's how weird that is. And she started to get in. And of course, she knew television was going to be the way to go. So she dove into that head first but as far as being at home she cooked we had dinner we sat down at dinner it was it was family it was because that's her background italian background is sitting down having a meal when my grandmother would come out she would cook it was it was it was that way and that's how i was raised your mom was one of the very first women in the industry to speak out publicly about the sexual harassment she experienced in Hollywood. That was a very courageous thing to do, wasn't it? Yes, it was. And, and it started, it started with, she, she had said way back when in some of her early interviews, she goes, well, I don't know if I should say this, but when, when she did Top and Anna on Broadway with Phil Silvers, and then it was decided that they were going to do a film on Top and Anna. The guy had, the producer or whom, whomever had said to her, well, I can make you the star of this thing if you, you know. And she, and she kind of took it back and went, excuse me? If you put out. Yeah, basically, without, you know. And she was always reluctant to say something in an interview at first. And then later on, she said, I'm going to I'm going to say it. This is before Harvey Weinstein. So. She said uh, one of the things that she said, <laughs> she told him, she said, you couldn't get it up if the flag went by. 
and turn around and walked off and all of her numbers in the film were cut. Every one of them. So tell me something. When you read your mother's book, Hold the Roses. I typed it. Were you surprised by anything in that book? I, I knew a lot of it, of course. I questioned a couple of things about it. I don't think there was anything that really, I mean, I knew most of it. I knew most of the struggles. I think a lot of the baby Rosemary stuff I didn't know because of course that was before my time. But I think a lot of that, I think she was honest in the book about her feelings, about her father, the fact that her family, her father had two families and it was just, I think stuff like that surprised me of way back when. The current stuff I basically knew, but the history of the family and the fact that he had two separate families was just amazing to me. I didn't, I didn't realize that that happened because that's one of the things. And she had always said, I'll write the book when my mother dies because she she was born illegitimately technically so well that brings me to your dad who you've mentioned bobby guy he played trumpet with the k kaiser band with bing crosby dinah shore many others he passed away in 1964 and your dear mom never remarried she always wore a black ribbon in her hair to honor his memory that is so profoundly moving When I saw that in the documentary, we all knew she had a little black ribbon in her hair, but Mm -hmm. I never knew why. That brought me to tears. Yeah, she kind of kept it secret for a long time, even in the book. She doesn't reveal it. But brought um, me to tears. It, yeah, the thing in the film, and the one thing that I love that Jason did in the film, he he looked at the film. He said. There's so much, but this is a love story. And anybody, when we had screenings of the film, women were crying their eyes out. I mean, absolutely crying their eyes out. Not just women, baby. <laughs> well, no, it, 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 it's, they had a marvelous marriage. They loved each other so much. And when he passed away, she literally wanted to quit. She didn't think she could go on. Mm -hmm. She really didn't. And John Rich, again, the Dick Van Dyke show was still going as a, you know, and she said, I can't, I can't do it. I can't do it. I can't. And he came over one night and I was there, of course, and stayed with her all night long and talked her into going back and doing the show. She absolutely wanted to quit. She was devastated. She wouldn't go into her bedroom for a year. Really? Really. She was inconsolable. She slept in the, she slept in the guest room. She couldn't even go in there. So looking back, by the time she reached her 90s, do you think she was happy with the career that she had? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. As you know, When I came to her at 89 and said, we're going to do a film, she was like, work, okay. And going through some of the stuff, and I think the fact that we were digging up so much material, I I can't begin to tell you, there's, there's a picture, I think Jason's wife has it, of the scrapbooks that are just stacked like this. And the film cans, one of the things I was on the floor, we were going through film, film cans one day, 16 millimeter films and a a very quick story, NBC and their infinite wisdom, when videotape started to come out, they thought, well, this is great because we can re-record over it. We can save money. So all the early tonight shows in New York got erased. And so I'm sitting on the floor and we're going through, we had, we had one film that exploded because of the nitrate, because it was so old. It basically red went all over the place. And 
I pulled out a 16 millimeter film and I saw, and I said, Jason, this has the old NBC logo on it. And he said, yeah. And he goes, it couldn't be Johnny Carson, could it? I said, I don't know. So I took the straps off and I opened it up and I gave him the film and he goes to the window and he looks at the film like this and he goes, oh my God, this is Johnny Carson in New York. He said, this doesn't exist. And I said, we just found the Holy Grail. And so if you watch the film, you'll see that segment because we notified Carson, for, you know, and they said, are you kidding? You have that film? I said, yeah, she had asked them to record it. She had asked them to save it. So we had one film can of Johnny Carson in New York. That's when Skitch Henderson and that was way before he came out here. And it's an amazing piece of film because it doesn't exist. It doesn't exist. So can you even imagine how happy your mom would be that this CD is finally being released after all these years? Oh my, she would love this. She would get such a kick out of this because the, the Italian songs that are on there, the novelty Italian songs, a lot of them she wrote. And, and I said, she, and I'm looking at the sheet and I'm going, she wrote these? I said, yeah. She, and her godchild, wh whose mother helped my mother elope with my father, sent me an email and said, I used to sing those songs in the basement. I know the lyrics by heart, all of the old Italian novelty songs. And she started to rattle them off and I just broke up I, because I had no idea. She said, I played those over and over and over. Now we all get to hear them. You all get to hear these novelty Italian songs, you know, the Iceman and Romeo, the Romeo. I don't know. It's just the first time I heard them, I said, oh, my God, I had never heard these before, ever. And there's a song on there that Jimmy Durante wrote because she was very close with Jimmy also. And it's called Chittabee, Chittabee, Chittabee. I guarantee you, if you play that, you will never get that out of your head. I'm, 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 I'm warning you right now, if you play that, you will get up and you'll be walking. You'll go Chittabee, Chittabee, Chittabee. It just, I, I heard it. I could not stop thinking it. it was it's crazy and there are some marvelous songs on there one of the ones as a matter of fact talking about my father she was in such a depression at that time she got a call from dean martin and dean had had his show on at the time and he said rosie i want you to come in and sing because Dean Frank, all of them knew her as a very good singer. Not, you know, TV was one thing, but they all knew she could sing. And he said, I want you to come in and sing. And she goes, Dean, I don't think I can do it. I, I, I just really, I, I, and Dean knew that he had to, he was trying to help her get out of this depression that she was in. It was a major depression. And we, he figured the only way to get her out was to get her to work. It was the only way. And so he said, you can sing whatever you want to sing. I don't care. He said, I want you to come and I want you to sing on my show. And she said, I, I you know, she hemmed and hawed about it. I remember her saying, I don't think I can do it. This and that and the other. But it was work. And she thought, okay. And so she picked out the song Little Girl Blue. Oh. And she sang, it was the only time she ever sung it. And he was right there with her on the screen. And I heard it. I hadn't heard it for a long time. And when we were going through the CD and I heard her sing Little Girl Blue, I just, the tears just, you can't hear that song knowing what she went through and not react. And she sings it as, as tough as she can sing it and as good as she can sing it. And Dean is right there with her. And you be, because she had said, I don't think I can do this alone. He said, I'll sit there with you. And he did. 
And so Little Girl Blue is on the CD. And when you hear it, I guarantee you, if you know the story behind it, you it's it'll it'll tear your heart up. Well, everyone will know the story now. I want to tell our viewers that you can learn more about Rosemarie by going to the official website, MissRosemarie.com. You can mm -hmm. also get the latest information on Twitter at, at Rosemarie for Real, as well as on Facebook and Instagram at Miss Rosemarie. And don't forget to subscribe to the official Rosemarie YouTube channel, which is called Hold the Roses. Well, Georgiana, it's been such a pleasure meeting you and having this chance to pay tribute to your wonderful mother, the unforgettable Rosemarie. Thank, Thank you. for everything you're doing to perpetuate and honor her legacy. Thank of you. Course, thank you so much for taking the time to appear on our show. Oh, it, it's it's been a pleasure talking to you. I, I I'm 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 thrilled to talk about her with somebody that that knows her and appreciates her as much as you did. So I sure do. And I can't wait for that CD to arrive. I've ordered it. I can't wait. Oh, it's it's it's. You will you will absolutely love it. Her fans are going to go crazy. Her fans are already ordering it, and and it's 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 exciting. It truly is. You're going to hear a whole different person. Other than there's so much more to her than just the Dick Van Dyke Show. Dick Van Dyke Show was only five years of her life. That's well, it. Thank you again for appearing on the show. Our guest has been Georgiana Guy Rodriguez, the daughter of the incomparable Rose Marie. The new CD entitled Rose Marie Sings, The Complete Mercury Recordings and More will be released on August the 11th and you can order it online at MissRosemarie.com and on the Sepia Records website, SepiaRecords.com. My name is Harvey Brownstone. Thank you to my producer, Steve Silver, my director of programming, Deborah Batsafin, my PR director, Laurie Towers, and my entire team at the XPTV1 Network in the UK. Thank you all for joining us. See you next time. Thanks for watching. Be sure to check out all the great interviews on the Harvey Brownstone Interviews YouTube channel. Don't forget to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified when new videos are posted.